he's going to talk about it because I think it could benefit all of us. So there he is, right on cue. He must have heard. I was just saying, you're going to come in. Fred? Uh, uh, Boy, tell us a little bit. I, I was just mentioning, you've done kind of a phenomenal turnaround here. Salt Lake Club. The Salt Lake Club for years has been losing, losing, losing membership. And about two years ago, we started this dialogue on the district level about saying, look, in this district, if you took Salt Lake out from the beginning and the ending numbers, we've increased membership about 30 or 40. They are the flagship of Rotary in uh, Utah. And Floyd got really heavily involved in some making some changes there. And I asked him if he'd come in and take a few minutes to just talk to you a little bit about what they've, that they've done to make that phenomenal turn, uh, turnaround. Because although your clubs aren't as big as the Salt Lake Club, some of your clubs, as you can see from the numbers, right, have been on that same track. And even if your club is not on that same track, if it's increased, you can you can benefit from the stories of others. So I asked him if he'd just come in and share a few minutes with us and, and talk to us about it. Time George. Thanks, Kelly. Um, this is always kind of humbling for me because I, I believe that I'm a much better lieutenant than I am a, a president. But I guess nobody else was left in the Salt Lake Club, so they said, it's your turn. And, and here I am. And so... I'm going to do my very best this year, and, and the first thing everybody knows as well is that if you're going to be the president, you better get everything going before you start, because I, I've watched this for two or three years now. If the president comes in and says, here's what we're going to do, you're five, six months into it before you've even had a chance to get going. And so we have a fabulous president of our club, the big, the tallest guy here, Mike Deputy. Everybody will know what I'm talking about. And I've gone to Mike and said, the last thing I want to do is interrupt anything that you've got going, but would it be okay if if I start to engineer some of these things? And he is just great and said, sure, sure, and how can I help you? And so that's one thing. Your relationship with the with the existing president is very important to, to what we have to say. I, we have, how many, how many of your clubs have internal foundations? So, of course, we have Rotary International Foundation, but Many of the clubs have foundations inside the club. Are you aware of that? Several of you do. And so I served last year as the president of our club's foundation. We carry about 1.3, 1.4 million. We can give out about 60, 70,000 a year in gifts. And that's really one of the important things for us in Salt Lake. We have very, very clear uh, goals for that foundation and the things that we want to do. A lot of you probably also know that foundation's got to be arm's length of the club. A club president cannot go to the foundation and say, will you do this? It's, it's got to be, for IRS reasons, it's got to be a kind of an arm's length situation. So for years I watched the foundation about a bunch of mysterious people were off in the room doing things, but <laughs> you know, the, the bottom line is they're, they're all there to, to help the club. And so it became very clear to me as the foundation president that we didn't have enough bodies in our club to do the things that have been happening for years. So just, just you know, look at this with your numbers. Uh, at one point in time, the Solid Club almost had 500 members. It's just hard for me to conceive of that, but it was that big. And we're down to half that. We're down to about 250. And so we're still trying to do things that 400 people did with 250 people and became very clear that we weren't, we just weren't getting to all the goals that we had with the membership. And so, I mean, a year ago, even before Kelly and I started talking about this, I knew that we had to get the membership up. One of my, my, my dad's actually here today. It's kind of fun to have my dad here. But besides my, my own father, one of my great mentors in life was a man named Charles Dahlquist. And a lot of you probably know who he is. And I've been able to serve with him in the Boy Scouts and in the LDS Church and all kinds of things. And one of these great sayings, and I know many people have said it, but Charles lives it, believes it, is, I am not asking you to do something that I am not doing myself. And I think one of the real keys to his success for all these years is he's been able to stand in front of people and say, I'm not asking you to do something that I have not done myself. And so it just seemed important to me that if we're going to have this big push and do something, that we needed to get people and we needed to get them quickly. And the club has seen me in the last three or four months stand there and pin probably 15 people. A lot of them are named Hatch, but they've still had the chance to see me to pin that many people. And how's that happen? 
Kelly, one year ago, said, these are the important things of membership. I took him for his word, and I said, I want to talk to you. And we had some one-on-ones. And then the next thing I said is, will you sit with me in our membership committee? He said, I'd be happy to. And I put that together. And we came in. He had a PowerPoint probably similar to what you're going to see today. And he put it on that membership committee. I'm kind of looking through here. I see, I see one of our club, two of our club members. But I, I, I will say this. I did not feel that the people that were in the membership area of our club were doing the things that I hoped to see happen. A lot of that was, was the counsel I was receiving from Kelly. And so, again, I went to Mike, to our, to our current president, and said, are you okay if we consider making a change in the membership area right now? He said, that would be great. Let me help you. That was really nice. And so we have, we have board members that oversee our committees. We have 20 plus committees in our club. And I went to the board member, that was me doing that, and said, I, I would love to see you look at another area of our club where you'd be willing to do that. That person said, sure, I will. And so there was that lateral shift, no firings for all volunteers, just that lateral shift off to another committee and then and then brought in a, a future board member. He'll start on July 1 and said, this will be your responsibility when you start on July 1, but let's be talking about it now. And so he jumped in and he said very quickly, well, I have... I have three or four subcommittees underneath me. I'd like to make a change in all those. So I'll help you. And so by the time we got through doing this, we made several changes on the membership committee. But now I feel like we've got people that are seeing philosophically the things that we've talked about on a district level that are now happening on a club level. And I think a lot of you can do the, the same kind of thing. Uh, I think that uh, in, in this part of the goals that I've got for our club, it's it's hard to bring it's hard to bring new members in unless you're creating lunches and activities that they're going to enjoy. Frankly, I think the Salt Lake uh, Club has it's got a lot of boring people in it, and they show up with suits and ties and dresses for the ladies, and we're just a little stuffy. And and the people I'm talking to, you're bringing this club are under forty, not over. We can bring it any way we like, and we have some backwards members, including my dad, who came in '84. But really, the ones who want to go after are those young ones, like a lot of us were when we started. And so, in my mind, I said to those four-year-olds, "What are we going to do to make this fun?" And they said, "Well, we don't want to be, we don't want to have to watch every week. So we go to squatters uh, at least once a quarter, and that's not easy for a lot of our members. Just, I'm just kind of think this through as I'm talking, and, and a lot of our members are thinking, "Well, I'm not going to go to squatters. Well, the heck with them. We're still going to have fun." And, and we're going to go do those things. We have great herbs, and we have, you know, we have the drinks, and, and I have a burgers grill and enjoy that, and, and we just have a great time there. And so we're we're becoming more social. We have we have dinner sort of split the club up in huge, many many groups, and we'll actually go to a member's home and, and have dinner. And these take the place of that of that lunch in that day, so they know that the budget of money is going into whatever that activity is. And I think that's been a big help. There are other things that those four-year-olds have said, I want to see, and we're trying to bury when we can. I'm just trying to bury we can to let our hair down a little bit and and, uh, and appear fun, because we all know that they'd, they'd rather do things electronically. They don't think they need to meet once a week. They probably don't think they need to have you know, situations like this where we come in and learn. And so we're really trying. I thought, you know, today, why don't I, why don't I entice everybody? We designed a shirt for today. So let's like a team when we get there. And, and so, you know, that's something else we threw out. We're, we're just doing everything we can to see if we can do this. That's a pretty aggressive goal, but I'd like to see still from 250 to at least 300 because I know that that will put money in the foundation, our internal foundation, and that will help make things work a lot easier. Um, I think it's very important. Rotary is supposed to be diverse. When I started, there were women in Rotary. That's how long I've been in there. And we have some incredible uh, female members of our club. I'm sitting here, I don't want to embarrass her, but I, <clears throat> I'm just so thankful to have people that think in, in the business realm and philosophically the way I do, the way Rotarians do, and they've come and had a huge impact. And what's interesting is most of those subcommittees are now run by women and not by men, who I think I work with just as well or better, and I think that they're probably more organized to do the kind of things that we're talking about. Uh, in other words, I can go to them and say, well, here's the list of who's doing things in Salt Lake under 40, and they're going to take that list and do something with it rather than put it in their file. And I, and I think that's been helpful. Um, 
We have also gone after civic leaders. We, we have honorary members of our club. And, you know, we don't see them a lot, but it's kind of nice to have them you know, as, as part of our club makeup. So we have a guy named Monson and another guy named uh, uh, who's the, the Catholic uh, Bishop uh, Wester. And we have the, the mayor of Salt Lake, and, and we've tried to do those kinds of things and, and make them honorary members of our club. And so in your geographical regions, you might want to think about that. Once they're an honorary member, it's a lot easier to get them to come. When, uh, when mayor, um, mayor, sorry, mayor, Becker. Becker. Thank you, Becker came this week. We had the we had the bigger attendance we've had in a long, long time. Uh, back to those lunches. As the president elect, I'm in charge of all of our, our lunches this year, and uh, for example, and we can do it. I guess because we're in Salt Lake, we've got a bigger crowd, but. So we had the, the Salt Lake mayor last week. We're going to have the chief this week. How, how good is the timing on that one? Have the police chief come in. And months ago, I put as his title, as, as what he would discuss, is there a problem? And how timely is that to have the, the chief come in and talk about that? The week after, I got busted. I, I lost the speech we had two weeks ago. We have, a, we have a newsletter. And I have a deadline on the newsletter, the 15th, before the month starts to get things in. We had put to be announced. But I went into our club, and we've got a guy who's just come back, not from an LDS service mission, but from a, from a, it's a, it's a different foundation, who actually sent he and his wife to Kurdistan, Iraq. And he's going to come back and talk about not the easy things, but what were the difficult things he saw. And, and how did he overcome those? And then the week after, we have one of the members of our club who will come in and talk about legislation and kind of give us an update of what happened there. So we really try to, to appeal to, to all that come and, and make that fun. It's a tradition that we go to a downtown club, so we are more expensive than, than some of the others with our lunches. But one of the, I think, the really great things we do is a lot of you have just tremendous fundraisers. But we are a fundraiser. Whether I show up at a lunch or not, my money, well, if I don't show up at lunch, my money goes in the kitty anyway. So I have a monthly bill. And whether I go or not, that, that goes in. And that's a, a helpful thing to us and the things we're trying to do. Is that what you That's what I wanted. Okay. Now let me just say this, Wade. Some of you are looking at the sheet and you see that Salt Lake Red uh, Rotary Club is in the yellow, which means they have a gang members and they have a boss members. And you said, what is wrong with this Kelly? He brings in someone from a club that, if you look at the history, has been a declining membership. This is my response. When you are riding on the Titanic and you're headed for the iceberg, it's hard to turn the big Titanic around. It's hard to turn it around. Membership organizations, I watched the Utah Public Employees Association go from 15,000 members down to 4,000 members. That takes talent. It really takes talent. I mean, you have to work hard to do that. The Salt Lake Club, had gotten into this situation where the people that were there loved what they saw. That's why they joined, and they wanted it that way. And they didn't want change. Now you've got a guy like Floyd Hatch and Mike Deputy that are going in there and saying, look, I've, we've got to turn this around. And if we don't turn it around, more of the same is going to happen. The climate. And for the district, that was critical because they're such a big club. So they were losing, you can see some of these years they were losing 30 to 50 members. And even though you were growing, they were losing, we were losing. And that's, that, again, that decline is hard to turn around. They turned it around. That's why he's here today. They've turned it around and you've heard what he's done, the innovation, the creativity. He's saying, we're throwing things out. We're trying different things. That's what keeps a rotary club vibrant. So, so maybe maybe the principal point there is that I brought in 15 people, and actually, I, I watched the number go three less than, than when I started. And that was really tough, but that was tough on one guy, the guy that wants to see membership. But to everybody else, I've been as positive as I can be and said, just bring one person in. If every one of you, 100 people are sitting there, they will bring one person, and we can turn this thing around. So, so probably, probably some of your clubs are the same. We found our people retiring and dying, and that was really hard. And so now what we're doing is bringing those young ones in, hoping that through time they'll become good ones. Great. Great. Thank, Thank you. Let's give them a hand.
Absolutely. Rotary is a transformational organization. Who can tell me what transformation means? We all know what transformation means. Who's going to articulate it? One hundred percent. Yes. It's it's going from one. Now, help me with your name. I, I know all you guys. I've met, but James. 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 Okay. So uh, it's 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 taking something from one state to another state. From one state to another state. Rotary is a transformational organization, and once we understand that. Once we inculcate that into our minds, it transforms us. Rotary is an organization literally, literally designed to change the world, and it has a plan to do so. And I want to show you <coughs> what transformation looks like. So here's a little video that's going to show you what transformation I'm going to need these seats. Come on, lady, you too. What they don't tell you there is they physically removed her from the bus. They also sanitized it because he didn't say lady get up. He used another word. And yet that one act of defiance changed the world that she knew. That one act of courage changed the world. I'm going to submit to you today that everyone that bears the name of Rotarian is Rosa Park. Because the world that Rosa Park grew up in was divided into black and white. It was divided into entitlement and lack of entitlement. And she was accepted 
I would submit to you that when you look at that video, there are people on that bust that were the same color as Rosa, uh, Rosa Park that were saying, get off your butt, lady, and get to the back of the bus. This is the way the world is. Accept it. I grew up, this is the way it is. Stop making it more difficult for some of us. Just get off your dairy air and get to the back of the bus. There were white people that were saying, who is she to try to change my world? This is the way it is. It's the way it's always been. In the world today, in the world today, a third of the population, a third of the population in the world today lives on less than a dollar a day, literal do dollar a day. Every three seconds in the world that we live in today, a child dies of a waterborne illness. We have the technology to clean even the dirtiest water and penny on the dollars. Water that you and I wouldn't even put in our toilets, kids drink out of the stream, the same stream where they use the bathroom, the same stream where the cattle come and use. We wouldn't even put it in our toilets to flush our toilets. They're drinking it. And that's why a child is. And we're told if we, as, as humanitarians, if we stand up and see, we need to, we say, we need to change the world. We need to do this. And we have people that are saying, can't be done. You just don't understand it. Now, if you doubt that, let me just share what happened with polio eradication. When we started our polio campaign, every great idea in Rotary starts with the Rotarian and his or her Rotary Club. So when we started that campaign, let me tell you how it started. Rotarians in the Philippines said, kids are getting polio. We have a vaccination for polio. Why don't we start vaccinating kids? Oh, well, you just don't understand. I mean, sanitation is so poor in the Philippines. We just it's just not going to make the difference. Those Rotarians said, again, just like Rosa Parks, look, get up, get up, lady, get up. Stop making difficult, the world more difficult. Get up, get out of here. The Philippine Rotarians said, thanks very much. We appreciate your input and start inoculating children. And guess what happened? It declined. Others began to join in on that. They saw what was happening. They saw those numbers drop, and they went, other Rotarians said, well, we want to inoculate. We want to inoculate children. And they start inoculating children. We went to the World Health Organization. And we told the World Health Organization, look, we want to inoculate children. And they said, you just don't understand. You just don't understand. This is a big project. Sanitation is so poor in these areas. It's never going to change. It's not going to change. In fact, you know, you're, you're looking at countries like India, a democracy. It's really easy in China to eradicate polio, but in a country like India, it's going to be the last place, place on the place of the earth. The last place on the face of the earth is going to eradicate polio. It just can't be done. So stop dreaming. After three years of our campaign in the world, dramatic drops in the incident of polio. The World Health Organization said, let us help you. That started out in 1985. We're in 2015. 30 years later, we have three countries left that have never eradicated polio on the face of the earth. The technology and the research and the science is so refined at this point. We can trace back when there's an outbreak in another country we can trace through DNA where it originated. And guess where all the cases that you've recently heard, the outbreaks, guess where they trace back to? Pakistan. Pakistan. Muslims come together. They have their, their trek annually. They carry the virus. A lot, of, a lot of the virus is carried in feces. A lot of opportunities, not enough bathrooms. Somebody comes home with polio. So we go back in, we inoculate that population, and they're endemic. Now, when you hear about endemic countries, a lot of confusion. People say, well, there's been outbreaks. Yeah, there's outbreaks. 
But in order to be entitled an endemic country, and there's all the three countries that have been an endemic country, an endemic country is a country that has not had an incident of polio for three years and has killed the polio virus in that area for over three years. So when, when they have an outbreak, that country's been endemic, like South Africa recently had. They've been endemic, cured it for three years, but now they've got this outbreak. So we come in, the Rotary comes in, World Health Organization, we inoculate all the children in that area to try to dampen it and make a difference. The organization that you belong to says, we are not going to accept the world the way it is. And we have a plan to change the world. Now there's a lot of great organizations you could belong to. A lot of opportunities, especially in our culture here in Utah, that you can participate in and you can be involved in. You could be a, a member of the American Cancer Society. The American Cancer Society is a wonderful organization. It's an NGO, non-governmental uh, organization. It spends, out of every dollar you give them, it spends 90 cents to attempt to cure cancer. Where do the other 10 cents go? Advertising, administration. Administration, advertising, those kind of things. When you give a dollar to Rotary, how much goes to administration? Zero. Zero goes to administration. Why? Because our model is when you give a dollar to Rotary, we keep it for three years, and then three years later, we give it back to you. We use the interest, but we don't spend the corpus. We send it back to you. Okay? So, so what happened here when the value went down, the market went down? We spent, when the market went down, we spent the most we ever spent was seven cents. Seven cents was that. That was the most we spent during those period of time. So that's happened in the history of the organization. It's happened maybe uh, eight times, nine times in the history over the, the generation. We are ranked as the Cadillac of <laughs> foundations in the world. I mean, the way we're managed, the way we're organized, and our oversight is next to none. That's why organizations like the LDS Church Happy the LDS Church. Most a lot of even LDS members don't understand the LDS Church has given over over a million dollars and just made a commitment to give another million dollars for the eradication of polio in the world. We are that well organized, and so there's lots of great organizations. And I don't doubt when somebody joins the uh, American Cancer Society and gets involved in that project. How wonderful is that? How great is that? Or you could go down the homeless shelter. And, and render service, or, or you could go to uh, any number of NGOs that make a difference in the world. There's one difference I submit to you in Rotary, and why you should be a Rotarian, and why you are a Rotarian, and why others should be a Rotarian. Because we're not consumed with just eradication of one disease, or one problem in the world. We have a six-step program, a six-step program that people like Bill Gates looks at this pyramid and they say that can bring about greater peace and stability in the world. I would submit to you that a mother in any of the Muslim countries loves their children as much as any mother any place in the world. So answer this question for me, brother, fellow libertarians. Why on earth would a mother strap a bomb on her child and send her towards troops to blow themselves up? Why would they do that? Anyone? They hate their children, right? They don't love their children. What? Because their ideology suggests to them there is greater good in doing that. Ideology suggests a greater good in doing that. I think that's part of it. They know that when that child blows up in their faith, they're going to go immediately to heaven. So what? It's a loss of hope. I would submit to you that that's more than the ideology. That would be my conjecture. I would say it's more than the ideology. 
Because in the countries where these kids are doing this, the people that flew those planes into those buildings on 9-11 had no future in their country. In these third world countries and in these Middle East countries, there's rampant, a lot of rampant unemployment that's going on. And so the people are so desperate, they're so desperate for something to make a difference in their lives, they think, well, at least because of my ideology, I can strap a bomb on my child, or I can literally fly planes into, an, into buildings, and at least I've made some statement about my life. But I submit to you that if we give them future, we give them a future, you're still going to have a certain segment, a small segment of the, the ideologues in the world that are still going to do the same thing. But I submit to you it will bring greater peace and prosperity. So what do we concentrate on in order to do that? Who knows what Maslow's pyramid is? Hierarchy of needs. Hier hierarchy of needs. Maslow's Maslow's argument in psychology 101, uh, all of us were introduced to it, was you've got to meet the basic needs of an individual before they can actually be self-actualized. Translation, it's hard to educate a child if the hunger pains are so severe in their stomach they can't move forward. That's the translation. So here is our hierarchy for fixing the world's problems and bringing about greater peace and prosperity. We talk about disease prevention, water and sanitation. Once you address those things, you've got kids that have healthier, uh, better prospects for a future. Then you have a maternal and child health, because we know that mothers are the primary educators in most families and teach their children how to read. So we've got to make sure that mothers are healthy and their children are healthier. Then once you address those needs, you don't have sick, hungry kids coming to, to schools to try to be educated. Then we talk about basic education and literacy. Then we move up the ladder to economic uh, community development. If you've got education, you can read, you can write, guess what you can do? If you can read and write, you know how to count, you know how to track, you can think, you can start to think better, you can start to make a living. You know what the common denominator between those people that are in prison and those people that are on social service programs in Utah? Anyone? The common denominator between those people that are in social services, and this is stereotypical statement, it's not everybody that follows but the vast majority of those people are incarcerated in the Department of Corrections. There's a common not denominator between those two individuals. Low level, of Low level of education. Most of the people on social services do not have a high school education. Most of the people incarcerated in our jails do not have high school education. Low educational achievement. Once you start to educate, Bill, the gentleman like Bill Gates looks at this model and says, this is brilliant. This is exactly how to bring more peace and stability in the world. Because if you can't read, if you can't get a job, it's easier for some despot to come along and mobilize you and say, those people over there are responsible for your plot in life. We've got to take those people down for more division of the world. But when people have the wherewith, they don't do that any longer. Rotary has a plan for transforming the planet, bringing about peace and stability. And at the bottom and the end of the day, every Rotarian that really studies what we're talking about understands the eventual goal of Rotary is that peace is possible. That's why we have 100 young people every single year that, that are called peace scholars. We train them for two years. We send them in dispute uh, uh, to, into uh, situations where there needs to be dispute resolution, and they're starting to make a difference. We're only six years into that program, but just imagine when we're 30 years into that program. Just imagine what's taking place. 
And every year I get an opportunity to go to a zone, what we call zone institutes or international meetings, and this is what we talk about. This is what we start to, to chat about. We start to talk about, we hear from peace scholars saying, let me tell you what I did in Crete to bring about greater peace. Let me tell you how Rotary was involved in Northern Ireland to bring about greater peace and prosperity. That's what's happening. And so I don't know if that gives you chills, but that gives me chills. I don't know if that excites you, but when I get up in the morning to think, I'm involved in an organization that really believes that peace is possible, and we have a way to meet the basic needs of individuals, to move them up the hierarchy so that they can become self-actualized and bring more peace and prosperity. That's why you should be a Rotarian over any other organization. Not everybody is. Look at what we've done with just 1.2 million. What do you think we could do if we could triple that? What do you think we could do if we had more individuals, like-minded individuals, like those that are in this room to do that? That's the big picture. And the reason I take a minute to share that with you in a membership workshop is this. That's why we need more moments. That's exactly why we need to go out and talk to people. We need to say, if you have this type of vision of the world, we need you involved. And when you do that, guess what people say? Guess what the Cheryl Johnsons of the world You talk barricade when I went in and sat down with her, and I told her, let me tell you what Rotary's trying to do. And I knew, I knew the minute she looked at me, she said, I need to be a part of that. Thank you for coming here today and spending 20 minutes with me. It was the best 20 minutes I'd spent in my life. Not because she joined Rotary, but I fell, I, 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 I uh, met a fellow sojourner on this journey to transform this planet. Because Rotary believes that every human person, every person born in the world, deserves an opportunity to realize their fullest potential. And when we convince people like us of that, they'll join. I don't buy, oh, this new generation, they're so young, they don't want to be involved in transforming the planet. That I just don't buy, I just don't accept. They're more committed than we are about transforming the planet because they're more connected than we were ever connected. These young people want to join. I'll tell you what the problem is. We're not giving them a vision. Without a vision, the people perish. We're not giving them a vision. We're not asking them, oh, would you like to join Rotary? Well, what is it? Well, it's a bunch of businessmen, and we have a few women that come every, to get together, and we sit down, and we have lunch. They're not interested in that. We need to give them a vision. What is Rotary? The most important organization non-governmental, non-religious organization on this planet to transform the world. Would you like to be a part of that? They say no. You say thank you. You're not the kind of person we want in Rotary anyway. You don't say that. You, think, okay? you don't say that. You think that. Okay. So I wanted to give you an opportunity to see transforming the, this and, and and share it with you. This will all be on the website. You'll have it if you want to use it. If you don't, don't draw it down. Heather, come talk a little bit about young people and their unwillingness to be involved in transforming the planet. Uh, so I think with transforming the planet, Kelly originally asked me to speak a little bit about what the Murray Club's done. Uh, we've increased our membership did it say 70% or something like that? Which I can take zero credit for as the membership chair. We have some amazing Rotarians with amazing ideas and that he district wide, it's not just Murray. Uh, part of why we've grown so much is that Mike Wells had a vision and he deserves the majority of this credit of saying, we want young members, we want to get them involved, how can we do this? So he went out and found some former World Rat kids who are now out of college and starting their lives and said, I want you to get this vision. This vision that Kelly talked about, 
<laughs> my bills went up to three, four kids, and I say kids loosely, they're between 25 and 35, and said, I want you to start a club. Don't know what it's going to look like, don't know where you're going to go. You get this going. So they did, because we're excited to change the world. We want to do that. As much as our parents did and our grandparents did, we want something great. So they got started, and they basically just brought in their friends. I mean, who better to bring into Rotary than the people you already want to hang out with and associate with? So they found former Road Rat kids that they've done service projects with or traveled abroad with or who had parents who were Rotarians so they already knew what Rotary was. And they grabbed about 26 young 25 to 35 year olds, half of them are married couples, and said, okay, let's start the service organization and we're going to call it Rock Rotary and let's get this going. And they have no idea how to get a Rotary Club going. Which is where we came in. Uh, Jerry Summer Hayes, how many of you have met Jerry? He very gently <clears throat> encouraged me to move to the Rock Rotary Club. And so I did, and they were trying to find a home and trying to figure out what they wanted to do and what they wanted to be. And I lobbied them and convinced them that they needed to be part of the Murray Rotary Club because we have this model of fun with a purpose and we want them to come along and have fun with us with the same purpose that we all have, which is to change the world. So after three months of back and forth and in and out, I don't want to make it sound like it was easy because it wasn't easy. We got the Rock Club to come and be part of our club as a satellite club. And once they became part of our club, we've grown the membership, so they're actually close to 30 in this Rock Club. We just did our satellite installation banquet, um, and it was huge <coughs> and amazing. We also said we're losing members because our age demographic of 35 to 55 year olds have jobs. And like Phil, sometimes it doesn't work to leave work in the middle of the day. Uh, the Murray Club meets every Monday from 12 to 1.30. Technically from 12.30 to 1.30, but you get there for lunch. It's 12 to 1.30 and you can't travel time in. That is two hours out of a Monday workday. And when you're running a business, that's really hard to do. When you're young and you are starting out in your career and you are not your own boss, it's virtually impossible to do. So we said, how do we get our members back? Because we have some fantastic members that have left, not because they don't want to be Rotarians, but because they physically cannot make it work within their schedules. So we had the brilliant idea of starting a Thursday morning club that would meet twice a month physically in person, and they could have breakfast together and start this Rotary Club. So Phil, after what, eight years? Yeah. After eight years, we were away from the club, we got him back. We got him to be the president of the Satellite Club, and I don't know if you're second-guessing that decision or not, but Murray Club is so great for the work you're doing. Uh, we have about six new members in that club. It's not enough to be a club yet, so we've actually asked some of our Monday afternoon club members to go to the Thursday morning club, help bolster the numbers, help build it. It will be a slow process. It will be a gradual process, but we're getting some of those people who are falling through the cracks, not because they don't want to be criterions, but because they couldn't make it work with their schedule. <coughs> in our Rotary Club, we lost a few people, some to retirement, some to death, some to moving away. A couple of our members moved up to Park City, and they've got some great new Rotarians. Because they didn't want to leave the club, they destroyed a different one. So we've about broken even. We brought in four or five people into our Monday Club. So as you can see, most of our growth actually came from the younger group, the 25 to 35 year olds. That again is because of Mike Wells' vision. Um, I think I want to ask and answer some questions if any of you have questions. But the theme of this is flexibility. Change is hard, change is scary. I was talking to my dad last night, who's the reason why I'm a Rotarian, by the way. When I was eight years old, women were allowed into the Rotary Club. And that just happens to be the year that my dad joined Rotary. And so I went to a bunch of his service projects with him. I still remember cleaning parts and being bell for the Salvation Army. And as an eight-year-old little girl, I turned to my dad and I said, when I grow up, I'm going to become a Rotary, just like you. And I did. As soon as I finished business school and I got a big kid job, I joined Rotary, Rotary just like my dad. I live in Salt Lake. I work in Orem. I'm in the Murray Club. My dad's in Murray Club. And I wanted to be in his club. Um, 
But I thankfully had that vision. As an eight-year-old little girl, I saw the service behind it. I didn't see the lunches and the meetings and the speakers. I saw that we went to the Boys and Girls Club, and we played with kids at the Boys and Girls Club. I saw that we cleaned up a park. I saw that we handed out dictionaries to kids who had never owned a book before, and now they have a book that is their very own that they get to go home and take. Rotary does some incredible things on a local level, on a district level, and on an international level, and that's what we need to sell. We need to sell that to young people. We need to be flexible. When I say it was a hard process, the two to three month process of getting Rock to be part of us as a satellite and us to be okay with Rock being part of us as a satellite, it really was. I had to talk down both groups multiple times where everyone took a vote and said, yep, we want them to be a part of us. And they took a vote and said, yes, we want to be a part of them. And yet still for another month, they were debating whether or not to be a part of each other. I'm sure you understand this in the legislature. You're like, no, we all agree. Okay, we'll fix that. That's okay. Part of that is the autonomy. Uh, the Rock Club wasn't even sure if they wanted, they were started to be a Rotary Club. And all of a sudden, some of the new members who didn't have the vision yet said, well, do we even want to do Rotary? I mean, they're charging all this money. Why not just keep it with us and then let us do service projects in the community? Why are we giving the international money? That seems counterintuitive. I don't understand that. They're charging us? Well, let's just keep all the money here and do it locally. And that took us coming in and saying, look at the big picture. Yes, you're giving to international, but maybe you're going to get far more back than you are ever giving out. Because you get the money back, but you also have this big club called the Marie Club where we have older members with a lot of money and not a lot of energy. We want to give you money to do what it is you want to do. This is actually a great combination. And we had our club where a few people said, whoa, this is a lot of extra work. You're just doubling our membership, which means as far as our county goes and everything else, this is going to be a mess. I'm like, yep, for two to three months when we get started, it will be a mess. And over the long haul, we're going to have 30 new members between the ages of 25 and 35 who will be Rotarians for life for two or three months of really hard work. But a lot of that comes down to communication, of me saying, okay, let's stop. Let's figure out exactly what it is we need to do, how I can take some things off of your plate so that it's not so challenging or difficult, and really getting people to catch the vision. So with the Rock Club, what we're doing is we're mentoring that club. Um, but Phil, I would have to say a couple words about the Disney Marine Club, because I'm focusing on the Rock Club because I think it's such a brilliant idea if you're trying to grow membership and you want to be members, is to be able to do something similar to what Mike Wells brought up. Okay, so let me talk about, the Rock Club is a satellite club. Yes. Rotary has initiated a satellite model, okay? A satellite model is where you can go out and take on a project, like younger people, you can have them as a satellite of your club. Your club, when, when I told Heather, I, we had this conversation, I, I talked to her and I said, well, why don't you just create a, a rotary club? You've got the numbers, all you need is 20. You've got over 20, why don't you create? She says, we don't want the work. <laughs> There's a lot of work, the secretarial work and the books and that kind of stuff. And they didn't know how to do it. And, 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 and that's what she told me, she said, they don't want the work. And I went, oh. I get it. I get it. They can do the work until they get more of the spirit of Rotary. But are they Rotarians? Yeah, they're Rotarians. And do they want to go do good in the world? And when I talk about good in the world, let me tell you this. I'm not only talking about someplace thousands and thousands of miles. I'm talking about right here. When, when I approached uh, people like Fred to start the Valley West Club, I didn't go out and said, I want you to help change South Africa. I said, I want you to help change the image that West Valley has in this state. You can do that. So it's kind of like Tip O'Neill said, all politics is local. So did you want to say some things about? Well, just just briefly, some of the challenges that we're facing, like Heather said, um, it's, it's business. Come, come on up. And when, when I was approached about getting back into Rotary, I 
still don't work in the Murray area. It would still take me at least a half an hour travel time to get to the meeting. And as Heather said, probably over two hour commitment on a Monday. Mondays in my business right now are crazy. I'm in sales and waste disposal. Um, we have meetings on Monday, we plan the weekend and so forth. I'm not the boss, I'm not the owner. Um, I'm, a, I'm a duty. And so it, it wouldn't work for me to take that kind of time out. And the people that we've attracted to this model are people that are very busy, that are out of town occasionally, that are former Rotarians that want to be involved again, but yet they can't make a, a weekly meeting on midday like, like that. Todd Reed is one, for example. He travels all over the world as a financial guy. But he wants to be involved. And we, we have tried to concentrate on Murray things and doing things that would benefit the immediate community of Murray. Our biggest challenge, though, is going to get is going to be able to get stable membership. As, as Heather said, we've got six people that have filled out applications that officially joined, but they're not always there. I mean, this last Thursday, Jerry and I were the ones that were there. And so we took the opportunity to plan out the, the calendar for the next couple of months. That's, we're just getting started. We've only been involved for a couple of months. And we really need to reach out and try to attract like-minded, like people that are in similar situations, young professionals, that are willing to just spend um, you know, every other week, an hour, hour and a half, at Mimi's in Murray talking about Rotary and starting the foundation of it. And honestly, my goal would be for this to be a feeder to the to the main Murray club um, as as our lives progress. And you know, my ultimate goal when I retire officially will be to migrate into the Murray Club. And I can't wait for that to happen. I've had a long history with the Murray Club. I was fortunate when I was in my early 30s to be a group study exchange participant. And then I joined the club after that. And as I said, changes in my life and my professional life forced me to, to move out. But it's good to be back. And the goal for us, I don't ever see this Thursday morning club being a standalone, you know, uh, Rotary Club that uh, has significant numbers, to be very honest. I would love to see this be a feeder club in the Murray Club. And I think we've got a great opportunity. That was perfect, Phil. Um, our vision, my vision, our vision in Rotary is that the Silent Club in Thursday morning is just that. It becomes a feeder club for those who can eventually move into the Murray Club, but continue to bring numbers into that. The vision for the Rock Club, there's two ideas, and it could go one of two ways. One is that it becomes large enough and they get trained because every one of their positions is getting mentored by every one of us to teach them how to do it, how to become their own club, how to be independent. So they can either branch off and become their own members <coughs> every year or two or three whenever they are ready for that. Or my personal vision is that they actually just become a feeder club to all the other clubs in the area because these kids, most of them, we live all over the valley. So as they progress in their careers, as they become more uh, financially able and capable to join a different club, that they actually branch off and move into each one of your clubs and that it becomes a feeder and a rotator so we're constantly getting new young members to come in. Uh, when I talked about not being so stringent and being a little more flexible, we don't charge the same price to the Roth members that we do our regular members. We charge them the bare minimum of what international requires. Because let's face it, when you are young and you are married, you're starting out and you're like me where grad school is $100,000 and you're trying to pay that off. So you're living in an apartment where you open the fridge, clean the dishwasher, you can make your dishes. It can be hard to be a part of something as big as Rotary. And yes, the members were like, well, it should be prestigious and you should be financially in a place you can do this. And that's great if you only want to bring in members in their 40s, 50s, and 60s. But if we want to get young, active new members who will be Rotarians for life, we have to be flexible. And we want that. Because as a Rotarian, we get to change the world. I love that I can talk to any person on the street and say, I am helping a girl getting an education in a place where she is not even allowed to read. 
I love that I can say, because of what I do, this teeny, tiny, little portion of what I do, there's a child who gets home more. There's a child who does not have to worry about where he's getting his next meal or if she can have an education. Because of the $8 I give a quarter, we are eradicating polio. I am a part of that. I am a teeny, tiny, insignificant person who quite literally gives this much. But I can say I'm changing the world. I can say I'm eradicating polio. Every one of you gets to say that. And every new member we bring in, they get to say that. How incredibly powerful is it to walk into a room and say, because of what I'm doing, somebody else's life is better. And because of that, we're changing the world. It's remarkable what we get to do in Rotary. And if we can share that and the enthusiasm that Kelly has brought, we should all be able to double our memberships because this is incredible. And young people want to be a part of something that big. It's just a matter of being flexible and being open and being willing to work to make it work for everyone. So. Thanks, Heather. Let's give her a hand. <laughs> so this morning we spent time talking about um, Salt Lake and what they've done to revitalize their club. We talked about the satellite club and we talked about the product that we're selling. And the reason we share these things is this is this is the way I learn. If somebody will throw an idea out to me, I know that I can probably take that and improve upon it. I know I can do that. And I know what will work in my club and what won't work in my club. That's the power. That's the power that's in this room. So we've talked about this morning, we've talked about, again, what Salt Lake did, we talked about what Murray's done to do this, this afternoon or uh, after the break, it's still the morning, but after the break, uh, Brent's gonna talk to you a little bit about um, what he's trying to do with the Satellite Club and how we can build there. But you're not gonna leave today without a tool. I'm a big believer in the tool. And let me tell you what a tool is. I tried this out on my, my 16 year old grandson who just learned to drive. I said, Ashton, I want you to go get my car. I want you to drive to New York. He's been to New York. I flew him there. He says, well, where's New York? I said, you were there. Well, how do I get there? I don't know. Get in your car and drive to New York. That's the goal. Drive to New York. Well, I know what you want me to do, Grandpa, but I, I don't know how to get there. Look, Ashton, get in your car and drive to New York. I know what you want me to do, I know the goal, but I don't know how to get there. How many times in our clubs do we say, we want membership to grow? Well, how do I do that? I don't know, let's, uh, let's grow. So on this list, you're gonna see, if you look under the goal, the goal at pets, if you look under that line, if you go down that line, find your club, it's the last column. So it's at 17, you have, uh, membership percentage and then you have a goal that's the goal your president if you got a zero there is because your president didn't set a goal of pets okay so if your club has a zero no goal was set at pets that's where that goal is where your club president wants to end and every single year for the last few years guess what we've done at pets set goals and except for the last two years guess what's happened to our membership what's happened to it look at the look at the numbers it's gone down for seven consecutive years it went down until we started using this tool 